you can really like short circuit growth by forming more strategic partnerships and alliances with yeah. other companies and with other agencies. And a lot of times we think, Ooh, we're territorial. Like, I don't, I don't want to tell another agency how I do this thing. But like, I think we're in an age of collaboration and especially as we move more project-based and away from AOR, like everybody is a specialist at something and everyone's good at a particular type of project. So partner up because, you know, media agencies need creative to deliver their media, Mm -hmm. become a preferred partner to them. Creative agencies need media agencies to deliver on their campaigns. Like, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and no one was around to hear it, did it make a sound? Today, I'm so excited to be joined by Nora Denuso. If you don't know Nora, she is the co-founder and chief strategy officer at Blood, Sweat, and Tears. We all know what that means. Where they develop, implement, develop and implement custom growth strategy that meets you where you are today, whether your goal for your agency is to stabilize, sustain, scale, or sell your agency. Nora, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining me. We were having a little giggle in the in the back, uh, the green room, because I was <laughs> trying as hard as I could to butcher your last name, but it's Denuso, right? You got it. Yeah, although <laughs> I sometimes get Denuso because if anyone's an NCIS fan, detective or agent Denuso, so I get that, Denunzo, Denuzio. The worst was like Denunzizio. I was like, wait, how oh. many Zs did you just add to that? <laughs> so it's not my name. It's my husband's name. So I don't, I don't take too much offense. Yeah. <laughs> I like the ZZO though. That's it's kind of fun. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> super excited to talk to you today because like this is your whole jam. Your whole jam is all of the four S's, like we just talked about in the intro for agencies. And today we're going to kind of talk about what it means to do all of those four S's without relying on the market, right? It's been a crazy few years if you're here in the US. If you're global, I'm pretty sure it's been a a crazy few years. But we are going to talk about how not to focus on what the market's doing for growth and to do it on our own. So I'm very excited to talk about this. But first things first, what made you decide to make this crazy leap and go out on your own and start a company? Yeah, I mean, it was a crazy leap. It was during the pandemic. Um, I left my agency, my last agency in October 2021. And I actually have two consultancies. Uh, I left to start the first one, so not Blood, Sweat, and Tears. So my first consultancy is Pitcher, like a pitcher of lemonade. Uh, and I am a pitcher. I've pitched hundreds of brands in my career. So there's a little bit of that double entendre there. <laughs> but the reason I started Pitcher was because I wanted to help small businesses with their growth. And so that's not exclusive of agencies, of course, or what I refer to as creative service companies. So whether you're a design studio, a production company, a e-com shop, PR shop, you know, it doesn't have to just be creative agencies, which is my background, um, but also like being able to work with brands. Um, and what I found working on the agency side for my whole career f- for 15 years was that um, we really never could help small brands with their growth. And by small, I mean under 50 million in annual revenue. So when I say small, I usually say under 25 million and people are like, haha, Nora, that's not small. That's like, that's enormous. I'm like, not from, not in the agency world. Um, and so that's really, I jokingly refer to it as my Bernie Sanders moment. I was like, wait, hold up. Why am I helping billionaires make more billions in the midst of a global pandemic when some of the, my favorite, you know, companies and brands in my own backyard here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania were closing at the height of the pandemic. So that was initially why I left and took a step away from agencies. And then my partner, Eric, in Blood, Sweat and Tears pulled me back in a little under a year ago and was like, I know you're helping small businesses, but also you know so much about agencies and how agencies grow. And he's doing something similar, but the way we come at it is a little bit differently. So we decided like in putting, combining our strengths, you know, I'll reveal my age here, but like Captain Planet style, like earth, wind, fire with our powers combined. So like with our powers combined, I'm more of a business developer. He's more of a salesperson. I'm more of a strategist. He's more of a tactician. So we're putting it together for agencies to provide end to end, you know, resource and solutions for how to grow and sustain growth in your business. I think sustained growth is the most important thing there um, because so I like to say growth is an ultra marathon. Mm. So, you know, and so, and so is pitching. So, you know, where people, I think where agencies fall down is sort of just like the exhaustion that comes from pitching constantly and trying to grow your business constantly. And so 
as I like to say, throw Michael Phelps in the ocean and tell him to tread water forever, he's going to drown too. Like even the strongest swimmers treading yes. water forever are going to drown. So sometimes yes. you just need help and you need just like a new infusion of support and ideas. So that's what we're here to do. We're here to help agencies grow. Well, I love it. And I couldn't align with it more. Are there certain types of agencies that you serve now? Like, is there a, a, an industry or a vertical or is it pretty much any business that's not giant bajillion dollar companies? <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, on it's funny, the large companies still find me somehow. <laughs> um, so it's not that I won't ever work with brands or agencies that are a little bit larger, but it's not what I'm seeking and setting out to do. And same thing on, you know, BSNT's side, like I would say Pitcher is focused on helping brands and agencies, companies under 25 million, which covers pretty much like pre-revenue startup through like Series C and even possibly post-acquisition. Um, you know, to get to a 50 million, like that's a pretty good scaling. And like at that point, if you've hit 50 million or above, then you probably do need an agency. But before that, like it's just not a great business model for an agency to get involved or for you to retain an agency all the time. And a lot of agencies do not like to work on a project basis if they can avoid it. Although mm -hmm. we almost all have had to go that way in the last few years. So that's picture. And then on the BSNT side, we tend to work with agencies that are like one to 50 million in annual revenue. So going up a little bit bigger, but once you get beyond 50 million on the agency side, then you probably have private equity investment. Then you might be part of a holding company. And as I like to say, I've always been in DAF. So I'm not really interested in working with holding companies. <laughs> My husband works for one. I'm like, I love your health benefits. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I'm not really that interested in helping like the big bigs grow at this point. They, I think yeah. they have enough help. <laughs> I, I would agree with you. Like small, the small fries are where it's at. So when we were talking about this whole concept of the market and obviously the past three years of the market's been top of mind for everybody, you kind of mentioned that you structure things in a way that, so that you're thriving independently of market conditions. So how does that work? Like give me a breakdown of how you do that. Yeah, I mean... As you can see already, I'm a, like a I think and speak in analogies. So here's another one. And um, I don't know why I use running analogies, because like I'm the first victim of the zombie apocalypse, <laughs> as I like to say, like I do not run like I do not run. Same, um, except for, for zombies. I would run for, for zombies. Years in. No, I wouldn't. I just be like, take me, take my brain. <laughs> like I'm done. Um, yeah. So anyway, I don't run per se, but I love the analogy of running for certain things in business. And here. So here's another one. I, I think I mentioned like uh, pitching is an ultra marathon. So I have an, I have an analogy about that, but this one is an analogy about wind and hurdles. So not that I've hurdled, but my husband has, he's an ex hurdler and he's talked about how wind affects hurdling. And, um, essentially think about wind as like the market conditions. So you have headwinds and tailwinds mm -hmm. in a headwind, you're running into it. You know, you're fighting against it uh, with a tailwind. It's behind you. It's pushing you forward. Uh, so we cannot control the headwinds and tailwinds of business. We cannot control when there are wars going on, supply chain issues, global pandemics, you know, what the Fed sets the interest rates at, what the government is doing with regard to the budget, uh, if the banks are failing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like all those things that have happened right in these last few years and and previously and and here and forward, like we cannot control market conditions much as we would like. So that's the wind. We can't control the wind. Sometimes it's in front of you. Sometimes it's at your back. So sometimes those years where you have a really good year, it might be due to market conditions being favorable for, in, mm -hmm. for our industry and not necessarily to do with how you're running and operating your business. So now let's talk about hurdles. Hurdles are things that are movable. They're on the track, but we probably put them there and we can just as easily take them off. So think about and break down. And if you can't diagnose yourself, as my daughter said uh, so presciently when she was three, it's very hard to therapist yourself. So if it's hard, you're finding it hard to therapist yourself. You can call me or someone like me. Um, I'm not the only growth consultant in our space, but you know, we can talk about what those hurdles are that are of your own creation. Mm. And then we can talk about how to get them off the track because you know you don't need to be running into a headwind all over a hurdle also. Take the hurdles off the track. Yeah, I love, I actually really love that analogy. And like you said, I'm not a runner. I will run for zombies <laughs> and I will run for donuts. And that's about, that's bears? about it. <laughs> Maybe bears. I don't know. I think mm. it would stand still for bears. I don't think you're supposed to run. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> I need to read up on that. I mean, my, I think my general position would be in any of those cases, just like play dead, just be like, you yep. lie here. <laughs> like, like you know that thing you do at the end of yoga where you just lie there and you're like, uh, deep breath. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to lay down and nap. <laughs> so keeping the track analogy in mind, because I really like it. How, let's say we're working together. How do you help me implement consistent growth regardless of the wind, I guess? Yeah. Um, so I have an, an equation, if you will, for that, which is confidence times consistency times time. Mm. And this applies to like content creation too, uh, but all things in business, right? It's like a lot of times the problem lies in diagnosing the issue of growth is that like, we're not as confident externally as we are internally, like inside our four walls, we're like, we're the best. We're great. We're amazing. And like, and you are right. Cause you wouldn't be in business if you weren't great at something. Then when we go outside though, to like talk to the world about how great we are, we have this sense of like wanting to be humble or thinking we need to be humble or thinking that, you know, everyone already knows what we do or no one wants to hear about what we do. And neither of those things are true, to be honest. Um, and we can talk about why, but so like confidence is the first point. It's just like getting confident and talking about how good you are at what you do and what value you provide. Then you have to do it consistently. And by consistently, I don't mean every day you need to be posting something like on LinkedIn, but you need to develop like a consistent cadence mm -hmm. because the one way I think about content and just telling, telling your narrative or your story in, in its entirety is think about like a baguette. Here comes another analogy. Now we're on to food. Okay. So think about a loaf of bread, a, a big one, a baguette. Mm -hmm. Much as I love bread, uh, since I'm not gluten free, I love it. But like I, if I ate a whole baguette in one sitting, I would have a stomach ache. And the same thing, like our prospective clients, partners, anybody who's trying to learn more about us, like they can't drink from a fire hose. They can't eat the whole baguette. They cannot absorb our whole story at once. And like, you know, as marketers a few years ago, when Vine came out with six second videos, you know, RIP Vine, I don't think it's around anymore, but uh, we were like six second videos. Like we were used to doing, you know, the thirties and the sixties mm -hmm. and the nineties second manifestos and, you know, the, the big anthem spots and stuff. And we're like, how are you going to tell any story in six seconds? Now it's like two seconds. It's like, scroll, 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 scroll. It's like, how are you going to grab someone's attention right now? And so it's like, there's no possible way to eat the whole baguette in one sitting anymore. You need a breadcrumb. And so take that narrative of who you are and what you're really, really good at and now break it into a thousand or 10,000 pieces. Yeah. That's what you need to do to like help people digest your story and your narrative and who you are. So confidence times consistency, because if you need to say a thousand things about yourself, you can't say it in one day or in one week. You got to use the whole year to say it or multiple years or quarters. Um, and then times time. Because I think what happens is like there are people, there are agencies who are fairly consistent with their content, but then something happens. It's pitch season. You know, we're pitching two, two or three things at once. We're in planning season with our clients. We're like traveling to be with them. We're doing mm -hmm. all these things. And it just like falls off a cliff, right? It's like going, 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 good, cliff into the ocean for like the next six months. And then you pop up six months later, and you're like, I'm back. And it's like, people have moved on. People are like, did you go out of business? Like, so it's the, it's the consistency, but it's over time. So you have to kind of remain that like consistent drumbeat, heartbeat of content and messaging about who you are, what you do, what you're great at. Love it. So let's just pretend, well, we don't have to pretend, right? We've, we've gone through a weird last few years, right? For sure. So how can we, we, the collective we of agency owners, how can we successfully adapt when the market shifts, like we had, let's just say last year happened, like what are you, what are your like top three rules for, okay, yeah, the market's in the toilet right now, but if you do this, this, and this, you'll be okay. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, and I never like to say, you know, carte blanche, like just do these things and you'll be okay. Or like, I think there's so much just like charlatanism going on online, to be completely honest, like especially in LinkedIn, it's like, just do my five-step process. Just take my course and you'll 10X your business. You'll 10X your life. Like that's a load of baloney. You know what yeah. I mean? So like, I never want to say like, well, just do this. And like someone asked me today, cause I did like an AMA on LinkedIn, like an AMA post. And then 
someone was like, can you define in your own words, growth hacking? I haven't even answered Vin about this yet, but like, I hate that term. Like, Mm -hmm. it's like, as if there's some just hack that's like going to fix everything. Like I like to say there's no six minute abs in growth or business development. So like, it's truly is work. And you also have to like, see what works and see what doesn't like, you have to treat it like a media plan. Like the way you talk about a media mix, like Eric and I talk about growth mix. It's like, you have all these different tactics and like, think about it like a soundboard. Like if you're mixing a piece of music, here comes another analogy. You like, you're tuning things up and down to find the right mix, right? It's like, Oh, too much trouble, too much bass, you know, till you get the right sound. And so same thing with like our tactics for growth. Like it's not a one and done. There is no magic bullet tactic. Sorry to say, um, you know, and it's not six minute abs. It's not going to like happen overnight. We have to test things out quarter by quarter and see what works and see what works for us, for our own unique agencies, because you know, how many times was I leading growth at an agency and an owner would stop by my desk as the business development lead and say, you know, I think we should podcast, you know, I think we should blog more. I think we should like, you know, do a newsletter. And it's like, well, wait, are you just saying that because like you saw another agency doing that and having success with it? Or do you truly want to do that? Like, if you don't like to write, like, why am I going to make you do a blog post? Or like, if you don't like to talk to people and you're possibly more introverted, why are you going to be on a show like this? You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, don't fight. A, I mean, yes, like expand and improve your skills always as like a, adults in our world when we have to like be nimble and flexible and, and evolve, but like lean into your personal strengths. Like there are people who love to write. There are people who love to talk. There are people who love to get on a plane and go do the schmoozing. And there are people who love to speak on a stage. There are people that are petrified to speak on a stage. So like you got to lean into your own strengths and what you like to do because that's what feels natural. Like I've definitely watched um, (laughs) like videos like this, like a video kind of podcast where someone's doing a three minute interview with somebody and I can't get through 60 seconds of it because it's so cringe. Like it's so cringy. And I'm like, why, why, who decided that that was like the right tactic, you know? So all that to say, I don't like to tell people like, if only you just did this, like you would achieve success. But one thing I have found for me personally, and I advise my agencies I work with to, um, is that you can really like short circuit growth by forming more strategic partnerships and alliances with other companies and with other agencies. And a lot of times we think, Ooh, we're territorial. Like, I don't, I don't want to tell another agency how I do this thing. But like, I think we're in an age of collaboration and especially as we move more project-based and away from AOR, like everybody is a specialist at something and everyone's good at a particular type of project. So partner up because, you know, media agencies need creative to deliver their media, Mm -hmm. become a preferred partner to them. Creative agencies need media agencies to deliver on their campaigns. Like, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and no one was around to hear it, did it make a sound? Like, you know, you got to deliver, you got to send it and ship it. And if you don't have the capacity to ship it because you don't know how to deliver media, then you need to find media partners. So that's just one example, like from my world in the like media slash creative dynamic, but same thing, like most creative agencies don't do PR. How can you find a a preferred PR partner? How can you find a preferred SEO partner? Nobody does SEO. You know what I mean? (laughs) In the creative world, we're like, what is that like, you know, black box of, you know? So yeah, think about, uh, here's an exercise that I use for myself and my clients, which I think is helpful in this regard. You know, we're presenting capabilities in a pitch deck or creds deck. We usually have that one slide that's like, this is everything we do. And it's like all this list of things or icons or something like the things we do. Instead of that, take a piece of paper, literally, you could write this down or make a slide, whichever, divide it in half down the middle. On the left, what we do, and write down everything you do do, which is basically that capability slide. On the right, what we don't do, write down everything you suck at or are not good at and find a strategic partner or alliance for those things. It will drastically expand your at-bats and uh, your your shots for business, developing business. That's my, uh, that's a great strategy I have. Yeah, sure. I was going to say, that's a wonderful piece of advice. And I love that you said this is the age of collaboration because I think that's true, right? More and more companies and big brands are, are moving away from an agency of record and they're really, you know, niching down themselves with how they outsource. So, you know, if yes. they want SEO, like you said, they're going to pick, uh, you know, a, a, an agency that does really only SEO. Like that's their main gate. Like that's what they're really good at. And then if they want the creative, they'll they'll partner with a creative company who produces really amazing creative. If they want like a social care company, they'll part with somebody like us. Yeah. I, I love love, love age of collaboration. So 
going with that theme, what are some other innovative ways, or maybe innovative is too strong of a word, but what are some other ideas that you have um, or approaches that you have that don't rely heavily on market trends, but are little solid pieces to go out on? Because I love that you said partnering with other agencies that, you know, that's how we get a lot of our business is through word of mouth and partner referrals. But are there any other like ideas or tweaks you have to add to that? Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes along with what I just shared about partnering with other agencies, but also thinking about like how you can make each other money because this does come down to revenue, right? It's not just like of our own like goodwill all the time. I mean, you should, right? Like karma, like I, I say, I'm more about karma than I am about quid pro quo. Like I don't keep like a list running of like, I did you this solid in this favor, whatever. It comes back around, right? You know, the universe brings it back to you, I believe. But one thing you can do is let those partners know, even let your clients know that you provide a referral compensation for introductions. Mm -hmm. So not only hey, can you give me a referral? Like if you've been happy with our work together, whether it be a partner, whether it be a client, um, you know, we are building out our business. We're growing or we want to be growing or we want to grow in these areas or these verticals. Like we really want to get a client in the food space or the travel and tourism space. And would you be willing to make an introduction? Um, would love to, you know, have you be part of our partner referral network and we pay 10% of 12 months revenue for those introductions. Because, you know, it takes time out of clients' days or your partner's days to make those strategic introductions on your behalf. However, if they know that there's some upside for them, why wouldn't they? Like, win-win. And so, like, I've crafted that with my attorney, and you can write it as a reciprocal. So it's a two-way street. You know, you send me work, I give you 10%. I send you work, you know, you you give me 10%. And so, win-win-win, right? You know what I mean? And it's like, most people do that. And if you ask, they're like, oh yeah, we do the same thing. It's like, nobody talks about the fact that they have these partnership referral agreements, but almost everyone does or is open to doing it. Like I've never pitched that to a partner of mine that wants my help to develop business and no one has ever said no. Yeah. So just simply create one if you don't have one. And if you have one, remind people that it exists. I feel like you're speaking directly to me because we've always done that, right? I'm the only salesperson for B Squared. Um, so I've always said like, Hey, Nora, if you make an introduction, I will get you a piece of that pie, right? That will be your piece of the pie, but I don't promote it enough. So I feel like you're, you're speaking directly to me. Um, and probably a lot of other people out there, right? But it's so smart. We have, of course, the partners that I mentioned that we work with, but it's, it's a really good idea to remind people, Hey, we do this thing. All you have to do is make an intro. I'm not asking you to sell, right? A lot of people be like, well, I'm not a salesperson. No, 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 no. I'm just asking for an introduction. And if it turns yeah. into something, you benefit too. I love yeah. that. I do it over LinkedIn a lot in the DMs. You know, if you're if you're a DMs person like me, uh, I tell my clients, like, don't email me. I'm a horrible emailer. My inbox is like trash because I get so much spam. I'm like, if you want something, text me. Or like they people notify me on LinkedIn. So that's the perfect place to do it, right? Because you can see each other's profiles. So it's like, hey, you know, company that needs social media, meet my friend Brooke. Like that's exactly what she does. Or hey, I heard you say in our last conversation that you need this. Here's someone who can help you. Yeah. Meet, chat it up and have fun. That's it. You know what I mean? It's like it takes me probably, I don't know, a couple minutes to write those. Like it is not a sales pitch whatsoever. Um, and I jokingly refer to it as like help I need a because people call me all day long and are like, help, Nora, I need a website, help, I need a rebrand, I need a strategist, I need SEO, I need paid media. Like, who do you know? Who do you know? And the one thing I will say as a business developer, you must provide if you want an, an introduction like that is a budget. Because yeah. people need to know the size of the prize, they need to know what's at stake, and they need to know if like it's the right fit for them. Cause I'll tell people. Look, I know people who can make a thousand dollar website. I know people who can make a million dollar website. So, like, which one do you want? It's like uh, if you go to a home builder and you say, "Make me house," they're gonna like <laughs> laugh at you. They're gonna be like, "What house? Out of what materials? Where? On what size of a lot? Is it yeah. you know? Is a one bedroom shack? Is it a ten bedroom mansion? Like, you have to give context for like what the opportunity is. So, if you can't tell me what your budget is or you're not willing to discuss your budget, then it's an it's a no go. It's a non starter. But assuming you have a budget, a timeline in mind, or you're willing to discuss it with me, then I will introduce you to people who can do it. And then whoever wins that job pays me that finder's fee because I just developed their business for them. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that's such sound advice. I think everyone, if you're listening, which you are, or you're watching, you know, um, if you're helping people out with I need a... <laughs> Help, Anita. <laughs> Get the budget from that person. Even if they say, I don't know, just say exactly what you said. Like, look, I work with people who make $1,000 websites and I work with people who make million dollar websites. As soon as you say million dollar websites, they're they're probably going to come up with a budget, right? Like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm like at the $5,000 range or whatever. So I love yeah. that. Um, yeah. So you may not do this, but are there any financial strategies that you recommend for the agencies that you work with to maintain, um, you know, stability during market downturns? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Eric and I talk about there's really three levers that you can pull as far as like growth in an agency. And you need to be thinking about all three. So the first and is the most important is retention. And we combo retention with organic growth because they are like sisters, right? So you've pitched and won a piece of business. They're now your client. The goal is for you to retain them as long as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. We know retention and like duration of client relationship is down from what it used to be. Like gone are the days where you hear about like my agency of 30 years or something <laughs> like that. Um, but your job is to maintain them as long past the two-year mark as you can. Because usually in the first year, you don't have any profit margin in that because you spent most of your profit margin pitching to win the business, if you think about it that way. Like mm -hmm. all the time you invested to get the business in the door eats into your profit margin for that account for the first year. So you want to retain it into year two, three, four, and beyond if possible. However, we know that CMOs are turning over every 18 to 24 months now. So that's a, that's a tall order sometimes. But retention number one, Organic growth, number two, as part of that, because, you know, without that, you have a pretty leaky bucket, right? Like you're winning these new clients, but then you're losing them, you know, a year or two years later because you didn't manage it properly. You weren't able to grow it. So that's step number one. And new business or pitching growth, like that new growth, which is the next one, should never interfere with the retention of your existing clients. You really have to balance net new and retention. So the second pillar is net new growth, which we're all familiar with, which is new logos, go out, get the new clients. That is very important to the lifeblood of your organization, because if you do have existing clients that were misscoped at some point, um, mm. that are running afoul of their SOW, uh, and a lot of agencies, unfortunately, like are a little bit intimidated to have those conversations with their clients about, hey, this is out of scope hey, this is well beyond like what we thought it was going to be. And so that eats into your profit margin, right? So like you always need new logos to be able to kind of upgrade or replace, like, let me upgrade you, you know, like you have to upgrade some clients that are like bad actors sometimes. Um, and so the, the new business pipeline helps you to do that, to be able to say no, or to be able to at some point stand your ground and say, we're really losing money on this deal or we're, we're barely breaking even. We're not making margin on this. We love working with you, but like, this is just not working. Uh, and to that point, that's the third lever, which is profitability. And with that, again, a sister, which is resource optimization. So the way that you increase your profitability, well, one, change your pricing. <laughs> um, two is to like, make sure you're using the resources that you have and you're not adding to staff when you don't need to be and that you're optimizing for the talent and the team that you have in place. Um, and, you know, the whole utilization rate, you know, 80% billable and all of that stuff. I mean, I have things to say about that, but, you know, just generally speaking, you, you want to make sure your resources that you do have are as utilized as possible. And, you know, you can also complement any W-2 resourcing with 1099 with subcontractors and freelancers. So depending on your business model, like, you can figure out how to optimize that for profitability. But those are the three things, you know, retention and organic growth, net new growth, and then profitability and resource optimization. If you're not paying attention to all three of those things, you know, in conjunction with each other, you are going to have a leaky bucket to address. And profit is really, really important because if you're not profitable on any of that, like your existing clients or the net new, then you're just busy. Like I say, there's a one letter difference between busyness and business. Uh -huh. So, you know, you don't want to be busy. You want to be doing business and you want to be making money. Have you, as you've been doing this, um, have you ever seen a situation arise where 
a company was market reliant, right? They were they were kind of operating based on what was happening with outside factors and not those three things you just mentioned. And that strategy failed. And if you have, what did you, they, the group, learn from that? Yeah, I mean, I'll use COVID as an example. You know, this whole idea of niching down, you know, whether to be a specialist or a generalist is like a big and hot topic of debate in our industry. And I've worked at agencies in both models. So I tend towards preaching specialization, but not niching down so far that you're vulnerable when there is a market shift. So like, let's talk about COVID and how that shut down the travel and tourism industry. Mm -hmm. A lot of agencies that service travel and tourism, it's like they went from doing great to like, as I call cliff into the ocean, (laughs) you know? So it's like, don't create a scenario for yourself like a vulnerability for your business where you have a cliff into the ocean situation. So like that's one. Um, The other thing that is a little outside of the market conditions, but it does, it does relate is be very careful about how much revenue you have tied up into any one client. Mm -hmm. So when I started um, at the agency, I was with the longest who's now sold to Barkley. They had 60% of their revenue with one client. Wow. And which is very dangerous. Um, And that was a big client and big clients go into review and big clients make big shifts with really out a lot of care about why they're doing it. It's usually um, driven by procurement, it's driven by money savings and cost savings. Mm -hmm. So uh, my first task was to help them diversify. So if you think about like a unicycle is less stable than a bicycle is less stable than a quad or, you know, a stool is less stable than a table, you know? So like getting other legs or other pillars for stability, try to have at least four of those pillar clients if you can, if not more, and never have more than 30% of your revenue with any one client. Because when natural attrition does happen, which it does in our industry, instead of like, you know, having to chop off a whole arm, like a whole, because it was such a big chunk, you know, maybe you're losing a finger instead of an arm, um, you know, so not to like talk amputation, but you know, that's what I'm saying is like market conditions will drive some of those shifts. Like think about it, like a big, big client that you're working with, they are driven by supply chain issues, by tax issues, by interest rate issues, just like we are. And so if they make a shift in their agencies, sometimes it has nothing to do with liking you or you being a good partner or whatever. It has everything to do with money. And so you don't want to make yourself vulnerable to like victimization in that standpoint. So yeah, don't over niche down into one, only one industry vertical, give yourself a little cover and protection in that way. And don't put all your eggs in one basket as far as revenue. That was a light bulb moment for me because we've had a lot of guests on who've talked about niching down and how important it is. And I haven't heard the counterpoint to that yet. So I love your counterpoint because you're still saying, yes, you know, specialize, but be careful on niching too far down into only serving, you know, bird feed companies. <laughs> because yeah. you can go to, you can go to niche. It is true. My last agency was uh, a CPG specialist agency. Like that's where I pushed them to eventually, you know, in partnership with several members of the team is like, okay, when I started there, we had worked on probably like 30 or 40 CPG companies. And by the time I was done, we had worked with over a hundred. Wow. So at some point for, as a business developer, I was like, the pitch needs to be if a food and beverage company calls us, especially, particularly F and B, you know, CPG broadly or FMCG, you know, uh, the designation. But essentially, if a, a food and beverage company came to us, I'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, we've worked with over 100 brands in food and beverage, every aisle of the grocery store. So we probably worked with yours. So let's like have a conversation about what you need. And like, that's a really fast pitch. And it was very easy versus like, oh, we worked with like two higher ed companies and two manufacturing companies and one of this. And it's like, you know, there was a study. I, we always were wondering if they were going to update this and I haven't seen if they, if they have it. So it's years old now, but it was Millward Brown and the, I believe it was the four A's that did this in conjunction with each other. And they asked a bunch of CE, CMOs and CEOs of brands. What is the number one factor when hiring an agency? Like, how do you choose? Mm-hmm. And, of them, the first thing they said was, has knowledge of my industry. Wow. So, you know, that's why uh, if you want to break into pharma, but you've never worked on pharma, you're probably not going to break into pharma. You know, like a pharmaceutical company is going to hire a pharma agency. An auto manufacturer is going to hire an auto agency. You know, 
we had talked to PNG and we're like getting in on their roster and they were like, well, if you've never done beauty or you've never done like CBG, probably not going to happen, you know, and like retail feels the same way. No one could possibly understand retail unless you're a retailer and like the speed of retail. No one could possibly understand QSR if you've never worked in QSR. So it's very hard to break into a new industry niche if you've not worked in it before, which begets the question, how does one get into it in the first place? Usually it's through friends. Um, so, I mean, there are some people who are like open-minded to like crossover, you know, but a lot of times it really is like the industry, but you do, yeah, you can't niche so far down that like, it's too narrow. So like take food and beverage, like jokingly, like people talk about that as like, you know, competition and food and beverages share of stomach. It's like, <laughs> okay, we have one stomach and what part of it is like, what, which food, but there's like so many different types of food. There's so many different types of beverages. I mean, even between like alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverage, huge range, you know yeah. what I mean? Food, huge range, like everything from totally indulgent to totally healthy and everything in between. So like we were never at a loss for like finding more clients and more people to work with uh, in that space. And then, you know, CPG extends far beyond just food and beverage. So there were sort of adjacencies like pets and OTC wellness, um, you know, nutraceuticals like vitamins and gummies and things like that. So yeah, find a, find a niche, but don't make your niche so niche that like you're left vulnerable to like not having enough business to go after. Yeah. What about being proactive? So I feel like what happens when the market does what it does, right? At least based on the past like three years or so, you know, we're reactive to that. It just, it just, it's just how it is, right? We're all in wait and see mode. You know, it's happening now, right? I think we're starting to see things soften a tiny bit because the Fed's saying that they're going to reduce rates. And so we're all in wait and see mode, which means yeah. that we're all being reactive to what the market's doing. So how can you be proactive with your growth strategies and, and, and kind of tear yourself away from being in that reactive state to the market? I mean, I think we can take inspiration from those entities and organizations that have like have always been here and always will be like, I don't know, think about higher education. Like there are always going to be people that are going to college. Mm. There are always going to be people that are going on vacation. There are always going to be people that are eating food every day. You know, there are always going to be people uh, that need to plan for their retirement. Uh, there are always going to be people that need a bank, mm. you know, so think about those like types of things that like defy market variability, like the things we always need and we always do. It's like, apply that now to agencies. Like we always need a solid brand strategy. We always need good creative. We always need media to be distributed. We always need, you know, to manage our reputations as brands. And so there are those things that you're like consistently good at. Like you may have more or less of it from certain people, but like stay the course. Like, I mean, that's what like financial advisors will tell you. Like I will call my financial advisor and be like, oh my gosh, but the war in Ukraine or, oh my gosh, but what about this like thing that's happening? He's like, Nora, stay the course. And I'm like, why? And he's like, cause you're 40. Like, like <laughs> over time, you know, we have these reactive moments, as you said, Brooke, and it's like, we can't react and totally shift our strategy based on what the market's doing. Cause the market's gonna be doing something different six months or a year after that. Mm -hmm. So part of it is knowing it's that confidence that we talked about earlier. Yeah. It's like the confidence in yourself and what you're an expert at, what you can uniquely deliver, what you have delivered on for your clients. What are those results you've delivered? You know, what are you uniquely good at? What's your unique point of view? That really doesn't change based on the market's condition. And so I think that's probably my best advice is just to not get freaked out and totally change your strategy. One thing I think uh, agencies and brands don't do the greatest job of though is tracking who is buying their product and speaking to them, that does change. You know, the shift from Gen Z not being a buying group to becoming a buying group and having mm -hmm. buying power really threw a lot of brands for a loop. And now we're talking about brand relevancy and making sure brands are relevant. How does Gen Z think about brands and marketing versus how millennials or Gen X or boomers thought about it? And so not to make like a monolith of a generation or a particular group of people, because we know that's not true. But, you know, things like that, like staying on top of like who is buying our product or if they're not buying it, why aren't they buying it? Um, so there's lots of examples of that. And I think we do a lot of like guesswork and me search about what people think. And we don't do as good enough a job about going out and actually asking 
what do you think about this brand? What do you think about this industry category? And so research is something we know how to do and we can always come back to is understanding and knowing our target or our client's target. Yeah, that's such a solid piece of advice because as you were saying that, I was thinking, gosh, we've even shifted. You know, in the beginning, I used to be talking to boomers for pitching, right? And over the past, you know, I don't know, eight to 10 years or so, it's really the millennials who I'm talking to. But at what point are we going to start to see that shift happen? And, you know, maybe I'll still be talking to some millennials, but it might be Gen Z, who's who's going to be stepping into some of those those leadership roles. So that's such a great point to think about who it is, who you're talking to, who you're pitching, and you know what does that mean for your pitch structure, how you do business, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, Got to so get good. in their mindset, and yeah. you have to get in their mindset, and you also have to have empathy. Like I often talk about in business to business selling, which is what we're doing as agencies to brands. Uh, you know, we're thinking about problem and solution sets. But what we're often missing is a bridge of empathy between the Mm -hmm. two. It's like, not only do I know exactly what your problem is, but I empathize with the problem that you have. And here's how we're going to go link arms and go over the bridge to these greener pastures together because I have a solution. But like, it starts with people feeling like you empathize with their problem. I don't think we do enough of that. And there's no way to empathize with someone's problem unless you know who they are and what their problem is. So again, know me, search, go out and ask. (laughs) Um, okay, so last question. For anyone who is watching or listening, and maybe they're new to the game, they just started their agency, uh, they're about to start their agency, they've been at it for, you know, let's just say they've been at it for the past three years, which isn't new, but like the past year, three years, it feels like probably a new year every year because it's been so weird. What advice would you give? What one piece of advice would you give to these newer agency owners about building a resilient, uh, a market resilient business model? Great question. And I think, you know, someone asked me who's a newer owner today, like I said, I was doing this AMA on LinkedIn. So if any of your listeners want to come ask me questions after this, like come to my AMA post and we can chat. Um, But yeah, they had, they're newer to owning their own business and said, how do you sort of deal with the disappointment or the struggles of like not growing as fast as maybe you want to be initially Mm -hmm. Because rightly, like, growth takes time. And I'm in this great group, um, entrepreneurship group called First Gen Entrepreneurs. I'll give them a little plug here. Uh, and the founder, Andrew, had this great graphic. And it's basically like, it's like the idea of Sisyphus, right? Like pushing the stone up the mountain and, and just mm-hmm. how difficult that is. <laughs> and for entrepreneurs, that mountain is about three years. You get to the top of the mountain. If you can survive three years, then that stone is at the top. There's a huge amount of momentum carrying you over the back end. And that's where you see people being like, I struggled, I struggled, I like had a loss or I broke even. And then like a few years later, like I was making millions of dollars. And you're like, how did that happen? It's because like they kept plugging away. So again, growth is not six minute abs. I'm sorry to say it does take time. It does take effort. It is a quarters and years proposition, not a days, weeks or months proposition. So I think a lot of times I see agency owners, especially newer ones, abandoning their strategies or their tactics too soon Mm. because they expected results too soon. So like expectations need to match reality. So like if you're not familiar with like how long it's going to take to develop business or what your expectation on that should be, talk to someone who's been in the industry a little longer than you and just get that perspective because they'll be able to tell you like, look, stay the course, you know, Mm -hmm. or in some cases, know when to abandon something when something's truly not working and knowing the difference between that and not giving it enough time to like take root or take hold. So go back to that equation, confidence times consistency times time. You have to put in this effort over time, but you have to be confident in what you do and what you know and sharing that because, you know, there are a certain percentage of founders I work with that are fearing cancellation, if you will. Mm. And their reaction is then to never talk about their business ever again. And I tell people that's the fastest way for your business to die Yeah, because people need to know what you're doing. And perfect example, you know, I was working with an agency a year or so ago and they hadn't spoken or reintroduced themselves to the consultants, like the search consultant community. They weren't keeping up with like those comms. And so I was like, well, I know all of them. I'll just like represent you to all of them. So I'm calling around and emailing and just like, hey, like you might know of them, but can I get them back on your radar? And they're like, oh man, love those guys. Hadn't heard from them in a couple of years. Thought they went out of business. Uh, so like what yeah. a missed opportunity right and like all you have to do is like 
develop a cadence and the consistency of a cadence with search consultants might be quarterly. It's not, it's not daily. It's definitely not weekly. You will annoy them, but like, they'll all tell you like, check in with me once a quarter. Let me know you still exist. Let me know what you've been up to, you know? So like whatever that audience is, like figure it out that consistent cadence of communication to keep them posted on what you're doing. And I th I'm a big fan of inbound, I'm a big like social seller. So like, the best way to do that and not annoy people is like post it on your LinkedIn mm -hmm. and let them follow you and opt in or opt out. Like you don't control whether or not they follow you and that's fine. Like you just let them know the lights are still on. Let them know that you still exist. And if you're newer, tell them why, like tell them your story. Like people want to know the founder story. People want to know what you're doing, what you're up to. Like when I started mine, people were like, say what? Like you've been doing agency stuff for 15 years. What is this shift? And like the more I said about what I was doing and why, the more people I got as clients and the more people wanted to chat with me. So you can't be afraid to be your own hype human. I'll leave on that note. <laughs> be your own hype human. I love it. So tell everybody where they can find you, where they can find out what you're working on with blood, sweat and tears, all the great stuff. Yeah. Um, like I said, LinkedIn is sort of my one and only channel I spend the most time in. I wish I, I maybe eventually I'll be on TikTok or YouTube giving out some of this advice, but uh, I have little kids. I'm a working mom. So uh, it's really a function of time more than anything. So I've kind of like picked my lane uh, on LinkedIn for now. And so that's where you can find me is where we can chat. Um, and then if you're interested in learning more about Blood, Sweat and Tears uh, and how Eric and I work with agencies to support growth, you can go to, this is all spelled out, Blood, Sweat and Tears. Dot co. Awesome. Nora, thank you so much for joining us today and for giving such brilliant advice. I know everybody's going to love everything you had to say because I did. So oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Thanks for having me. This is so fun.